I'd like you to take your Bibles now with me and turn in these Bibles to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. John, 30, John 7, sorry, verse 37 to 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these few verses that again you speak to us through. And Lord, as we would look to these words, we ask you to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Last week we wrapped up our series on the book of Ruth. And uh, I'm planning for another series to start the first Sunday of March, actually, on the end times theology. We call the term eschatology. So, but while I was preparing for that series... I knew I had some more study to do, and I asked, Lord, what do you want me to speak on to give me time and preparation to teach on end times? And so I asked, Lord, for the month of February, what can I speak on? And so this morning, God directed me to share about this theme this morning, this sermon called Wandering in the Wilderness. Next Sunday, we'll talk about love, especially since it's a couple days before Valentine's Day. Actually, one day before Valentine's Day. It's the 13th next Sunday. Then the Sunday after, I'll be uh, answering some of your questions that you've given to me. We call that Sunday, uh, Stunt the Pastor Sunday. So we'll answer some questions there. And then last Sunday this month, we'll be talking about fasting, uh, just before we go into the season of Lent. And I'll explain what that is when we get to that sermon on that Sunday. But this morning, we're looking at the theme of wandering in the wilderness. Have you ever been in that season of life where you feel like God was distant? Where when you would pray, you'd feel like your prayer wasn't getting further than the ceiling? Maybe you feel like, maybe even questioned, God, are you actually there? Wrestled and struggled. Time of t turmoil, of maybe no peace, no rest. Maybe some of you in that, are in that time now, maybe. John Bevere wrote a book called Victory in the Wilderness, and he wrote this. He wrote, God does not bring us into these times of frust to frustrate us and to get us to give up until he sovereignly takes us out. The wilderness is not intended to be a place of failure, but of victory. This is to be a place, not a failure, but a victory. We sung about that this morning, didn't we? I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to the Lord. If you are wandering in the wilderness this time in your faith with the Lord, know this. God has you there for a good reason. And he has a victory planned for you. God's going to use it to do something amazing. It may not necessarily be the amazing thing that you may picture. But the amazing thing at minimum is how God is going to change your character to be more in line with what he wants in you. To use you for something amazing beyond that too. Mark chapter 6 verse 31 says, he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not have, even have time 
to eat. In this one verse in, chapter, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is calling his disciples to go with him out into the wilderness to be a time of rest. Sounds peaceful, doesn't it? Except wilderness doesn't sound peaceful, peaceful at all, does it? When I hear the word wilderness, I think of a barren land. Maybe rocky, maybe there's some plants, but not much vegetation. A dry place. Maybe even a desert. The barren wilderness. Or even here in Canada, maybe we go out a little further north to what we call the frozen tundra, right? <laughs> place where there's all snow covered and you don't see any vegetation for miles. Maybe you'll see a polar bear, maybe, but but a wasteland seems like, doesn't it? It feels like that when we're in that place sometimes, doesn't it? But God sometimes calls us into this place. And yes, it is to be a place of rest, even though we may not feel like it at first. We contrast the wilderness to a mountaintop, right? We like the mountaintop. I remember going for hikes as a teenager in my college days going on different hikes up mountains. I love to go on these hikes because I always love to get to the top, to see the beauty, be able to look across the landscape. You know, one hike I did one time in college, a hike is called All Stones, and you get to the top there, and there's this beautiful pond. And the pond's so clean, you can go swimming in it, and the fish, you can eat, fish the fish and eat the fish from there too. It's a beautiful landscape to be at, and even to look out upon the valley and see the other mountains too. Just a beautiful sight to behold. We like that, don't we? That's where we want to be all the time. We even like, compare that to life sometimes. We love those mountaintop experiences, right? They excite us. But God actually has us more in the valley than usually than the mountaintop, doesn't he? And even sometimes in those wilderness experiences. Be of good cheer, though. Even though we have this need to be in the wilderness, think of some of the mightiest people that God has ever used in history. Think of Moses. Where did God send him? To the wilderness, right? Some of us is only doing. He murdered a man, and so he had to flee, but he went into the wilderness. And it was in the wilderness that God spoke to Moses. How about Elijah? Remember the story of Elijah? He had just had a mountaintop experience where he was up there and he had this battle between himself and the prophets of Baal and God came through and burnt up the offering on the altar that he had built. While Baal obviously didn't because Baal is not a real God. And it was a mountaintop experience there but then after that he went down from the mountain and he had heard that Jezebel was going to be after him to kill him, and so he ran off into the wilderness. And if you know the story of Elijah in this story, he, he felt f bad for himself. He, some think, think, thought he felt depressed, which could very well be. And he had a conversation with God, and he said, I'm the only prophet left, the only man of God left. But God still used that experience for Elijah to do something more amazing yet. How about Jesus? He too spent time in the wilderness. He spent 40 days in the wilderness, fasting. And it wasn't easy for him either too because Satan came along and tempted him too. Three times. But again, it was in preparation for what the Father had planned for Jesus to do to do some amazing things, some ma amazing miracles. The greatest of all was to die on the cross and rise three days later. So if you feel right now that you're in the wilderness, you're in a good place. Because God has had some amazing people in this place to shape them for the work that God was about to do through them. There's three things we're going to look at through this passage this morning on walking through the wilderness. And the first one is this. Seek by coming to Jesus. Can you, can you push to the next slide, please? I forgot the remote this morning, so I'll just ask you to push. 
Oh, right there. Thank you. Glad you're on top of it. I wasn't on top of it this morning. So the first thing is to seek by coming to Jesus. The point of being in the wilderness is, is to seek God. Let's look at verse 37 of our passage again. Here's what it says. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. We are to come to Jesus when we're in that wilderness time. It's often seen as a time of, of dryness too, isn't it? If you're going through the wilderness time in your faith too, it feels like that way. You feel like you're thirsty spiritually. You feel like there's no nourishment in that period, doesn't it? But Jesus tells his disciples, come to me if you're thirsty and I will give you drink. There's a prerequisite for us to come to Jesus. We must first realize that we are thirsty and we have a need of our thirst to be quenched. So as you're in the wilderness, recognize that. Because when we realize that we're thirsty, then we can come to him then. Think of the story of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Jesus is sitting beside a well and he sent his disciples off into town to get some supplies. And this woman comes along and Jesus asks her for some water. She didn't have much, did she, at that point? What does Jesus say to her? I'm forward fast a little bit in this conversation. Jesus said that if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water, for living water, and you would thirst no more. Again, here's this invitation Jesus gives to come to him and receive drink. And her response to Jesus was that, how, how could you have this water? Like it's, the well's deep and you have nothing to draw the water from. So how could you have this living water? And if you do, give me some. I'd like to have some. The conversation goes on a little longer still too. And he ends up sharing with her of how he is the living water. He even talks about the sin that she was living in. And then she runs and tells the village and they all come out to hear what Jesus had to say then too. Jesus told her, come to me. If you're thirsty, come to me. This is what we see consistently through Scripture and throughout our lives, too. Jesus is continually calling us to come to Him. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 29 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus gives us the invitation in the wilderness, come to me. If you're thirsty, come, bring your burden to me. I'll give you my burden. It's a lot lighter than what yours is. Plus, I'll give you rest. So part of quenching, his quenching our first thirst is to come to him and give our burdens to him. Then B, we need to sacrifice ourselves. We need to sacrifice ourselves. This sounds weird, doesn't it? But what we mean by sacrificing ourselves here is by surrendering our will to God's will. It's coming to God and saying, God, take me and use me. Do what you will with me. And Luke 9, 23, it says, 
And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So we must come to him, surrender ourselves to him. And then see, we must seek him with all our heart. Seek him with all our heart. Psalm 63, 1 says, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh learn, yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Again, there's that talk of water, right? In the wilderness, it seems to be a place of, of drought, of no water. But if we seek him with our whole heart, we come to Jesus. He is the one who brings refreshment to us again. I don't want times in my life when I've been in the wilderness. I've like, Lord, I want to be out of this. Take me out of this. Take this burden from me. Take this situation, this hardship away from me. I'm sure all of us could relate to that prayer, could, couldn't we? Maybe you've prayed such a prayer too. But God doesn't ask us to, to leave the wilderness. It's meant again to be a time of blessing. God's setting us up for a blessing. There's a story of Jacob in Genesis chapter 26. His father had dug a well and, and some of their enemies had filled it back in and then Jacob came back again and redug the well. And after that, he found water. The wilderness time is like that. Maybe it's kind of like, it's like a spiritual well that's been covered in by the enemy. Dig deep seeking God. Because as you dig deep to know God more, He is the one who will bring water to you again. You will find refreshment from Him again. So don't give up. Keep on digging until you find the spring of refreshment from Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, that's in a couple steps of application here. First is dig deep in the Word of God. Dig deep in the Word of God. How do we know God best? By studying His Word. Being it daily. Reading it. Meditating upon it. Studying it. And if you don't know how to study it, ask. Come to me and I'd love to teach you how to study God's Word. And by the way, actually this Thursday we have our, our uh, homeschooling support group going on. And part of that time is we're going through a discipleship tool training our children in how to study God's Word. And if you want to join us in that, come up at 1 o'clock on Thursday and you can walk through this discipleship book we're working through together on how to study God's Word. But we need to study God's Word. Go deeper in it. Allow God to speak to you through his word. And second part of application is spend time in God's presence. Spend time in God's presence. We call this spiritual discipline solitude. Just being silent before the Lord and listening to him. I know there's times I love to have some solitude times. And I love those times because I sit there, I may have spent some time in his word, some time in, in prayer, but a time away from other people so I can just be quiet before the Lord. And I tell you, that's some of the most restful times. I often find times when I've done that that I've fallen asleep in. Sometimes I felt guilty, like, oh, Lord, sorry I fell asleep, but that's the best place to be when you fall asleep, isn't it? In the presence of God, in solitude with Him. So spend time in solitude, just time just between you and the Lord. Whether it be reading His Word or studying it, whether it be praying to him or listening in to him as he speaks to you. Or maybe it's just being silent before God. Either way, spend that time in God's presence. So the first part th that we need to deal with when we're in the wilderness, again, is to seek by coming to Jesus. The second thing we learn in our passage this morning about wandering in the wilderness 
is that when we're wandering in the wilderness, seek by drinking from Jesus. Seek by drinking from Jesus. We've alluded to this already, haven't we, this morning? That we're to drink from Jesus. Verse 37, again it says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Jesus is talking figuratively here, obviously, because the w- form of the language, right? We're not going to literally drink Jesus. No, we drink from Jesus by what he teaches us. Again, as we talked about before, going to his word, drinking from his w- the well of his word. There's a worship song that we, we haven't sung here Sunday mornings yet, but we have sometimes sung it in our prayer time on Wednesday nights. The song is called All Who Are Thirsty, and I'm going to read the words to you of this song. It goes like this. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain, dip your hearts in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep. And the course goes, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Such wonderful words that speak of when we're in the wilderness. All who are thirsty, if you're weak, if you're sorrowful, if you're going through trials and tribulations, come to Jesus. Because he will quench your thirst. There's nothing in this world that can take our, the, our spiritual thirst away. There's a lot of people who use different things to try to quench their thirst. Pretty much anything you think of, people will use as a way, a form of escape, don't we? Even as Christians, sometimes we find ways to escape, don't we? Or we try to. But in those trials and tribulations, in those wilderness times, when it feels like God is distant, come to Jesus still. And there's one good reason why. It's this. Jesus wants to quench our thirst. Psalm 107, verse 8 and 9 says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul. And the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. That's why we need to come to Jesus. Because he will quench our spiritual thirst. It's only coming to him, trusting him, that we can have our spiritual thirst quenched. How do we do this? By using spiritual disciplines. Did you actually know that we're actually practicing one of the spiritual disciplines this morning? We're actually doing a few spiritual disciplines all at once this morning. One is studying God's Word. We're studying it right now together. We've read it together, and and hopefully we meditate upon it at the same time. Those are all spiritual disciplines. Part of our time this morning has been spent in prayer. Four of us spent time in this room here before the service, praying for the service. And during the service, we spent some time in prayer too. So there, we're also practicing a spiritual discipline. Here's some other spiritual disciplines I encourage you to seek a looking at. One is meditation. We've talked about that a little bit already. To meditate upon God's Word. Now I want to make this uh, point here clear, though. I know sometimes when we hear the term meditation, we kind of get a little worried because we think of what other religions do when it comes to meditation. Other religions say meditation is you just sit there and you empty yourself to be emptied. 
Well, that's not a good state to be. So we know from Scripture that we have to be filled with something. So yes, we need to be emptied of ourselves. We need to be emptied of what is wrong, too, of what is sin. But to be filled up with Jesus. That's why, again, we study God's Word. We cannot do meditation without God's Word because it's rooted in God's Word. And when we meditate, it's actually the words of God that we're meditating upon. Yes, empty ourselves of ourselves, but be filled with the Word of God. So meditating is reading God's Word, pondering on what it says and what it means, pondering how we can apply it to our lives, which lends also to the discipline of study. We need to study God's Word too, because if we don't study God's Word, we won't understand what it means. If we don't understand what it means, we can't apply it properly. And we have seen a mess in the church in the, pa- in the past and even the present of some false doctrines and things that have been taught because people have not studied God's Word to understand it properly. So there again, study is a very important discipline for us and needs to be part of meditation. Fasting. Another spiritual discipline. I won't say much to that because we'll be talking about that in a few weeks. Simplicity. Do you know that's a spiritual discipline? Not worrying about having so many things. Living a simple lifestyle. Doesn't mean that we can't have things and enjoy things, but it's something to be said sometimes for letting some things go. Things that we don't need. Solitude. I mentioned that a moment ago too. It's good to have time before the Lord in solitude. To be quiet before Him. Spiritual discipline of submission, coming to God and relinquishing all things, surrendering ourselves to God. Service. Do you know every time you use your spiritual gift or a talent to do something for someone else or to do something for God, you're practicing a spiritual discipline. It's a great, wonderful discipline of service. Confession. We've done that this morning too, haven't we? Before we partake of the communion table together, we took some time to confess our sins before the Lord. Another very important spiritual discipline. Worship. We've been doing that all this morning too, singing songs of praise and worship to the Lord. So singing songs of praise. But worship isn't just music. Worship is also whatever we do that brings glory to God. Bringing honor and glory to Him. And lastly, celebration. Celebration, too, is a great way of bringing glory and honor to God. It's also a discipline that we're called to do. I think at the church sometimes we need to do a better job of celebration, don't we? I know there have been times throughout my life and in the life of the church where we don't do a good job of this. When there's things to celebrate, we need to celebrate. God's Word tells us that. To rejoice with those who rejoice. Yes, it, the part of that verse also says to mourn with those who mourn. Yes, that's part of caring for each other. We go through difficult times walking with each other. Sometimes walling in the mud with each other, right? The friends that Job had, they were good at first because they just wallowed in the mud with Job for a while. We need to do that sometimes. But we also need to celebrate with each other too. I remember, I may, may have mentioned this in the past before, but I remember a practice that uh, Central Baptist, when we, my wife and I attended there um, some years ago, one of the things they did to celebrate new believers was they would have a balloon on the stage. I remember Pastor Doug Myers would explain that every time they did. Whenever a child came to faith, they would have a balloon up on stage to commemorate that that person came to faith. And it was exciting to see those. Every time there's another balloon or t- Sometimes one Sunday there'd be one. Some Sundays there'd be none, but some Sundays there'd be one or two. I know whenever I see those balloons, I'd be like so excited. Hey, we have a new brother or sister in Christ. Something we need to do as the church better too. When someone comes to faith, celebrate with them. Hey, it's so great that you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Let's have a party. We should do that, shouldn't we? Get cake and... Blow balloons and celebrates someone's spiritual birth 
into the family of God. Or when we hear someone gets a job, celebrate with them. One person in our church this morning told me this morning they got a job. They shared job. Actually, Virginia shared that in our, in our uh, testify time. We should celebrate with her and say, great, congratulations, Virginia, for getting the job. Or if someone gets a raise, celebrating with them they got a raise. When a baby is born, celebrating with that couple. Or maybe a couple gotten married, celebrating with them. Maybe it's a child who graduated, celebrate with that family. Maybe your child got their driver's license. Celebrate with them. Someone overcoming some kind of sickness or illness. Celebrate with them. Whenever there's something to celebrate, let us celebrate together and practice that discipline. You know, the world looks at the church sometimes and thinks we're a bunch of fuddy-duddies. Those Christians, they don't know how to celebrate. They think celebrating has to use other things that aren't good. But sometimes people look at the Christians. I even heard this from some people throughout my lifetime that man, Christians, they don't know how to have fun. I'm not saying that we need to have, yes, we can and should have fun, but the point of celebrating together. I always look forward to potlucks. We haven't had one in some time. Because it's a celebration in a way, isn't it? Enjoying each other's food and fellowshipping around the table together. It's a celebration. Or Christmas. We had planned a Christmas Eve service this past year. Unfortunately, it got canceled because of the weather. But I know I was looking forward to having that time to celebrate God's birth together in community. How about Easter? Easter is coming. I'm excited about Easter. On Easter Sunday, we call it Resurrection Sunday, we're having our one church worship with other churches again that Sunday evening. Pastor Chris from Beach Corner and I will be leading worship for that. I'm looking forward to it because it gets, it's a time to celebrate together as the greater church. Celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead, his gift of salvation. So church, may we practice that discipline of celebration together too. It's one of those things I find it refreshing too. And I'm in those times of wilderness. I feel refreshed because focusing my eyes in worship to God. Singing songs of celebration together. So when we're in times of wilderness, we can seek Jesus by coming to Jesus and drinking from Him. There's a third point that we learn from this passage this morning. And that is, seek by believing in Jesus. Verse 38 we read, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his inmost being will flow rivers of living water. Again, those first few words, He who believes in me. It might seem kind of backwards a little bit this morning. Well, why are we talking about this? Shouldn't this be the first point this morning? Well, you might have a point there. But I want us to focus and remember here. The point is always Jesus. You can't seek Jesus if you don't believe in him. So you first must believe in Jesus and turn to him and surrender your life to him. So in order for us to drink from Jesus, to have our spiritual dryness quenched, we need to believe in Jesus. Part of this comes to understanding his word again. To believe his word. Right from Genesis chapter 1, right through to the end of Revelation chapter 22. We must believe God's word from cover to cover. Because it is his very word to us. I've heard many Christians say that, well, you know what? We don't have to believe God's word fully. We, we can take and, and give, give and take a little bit here and there. There's some parts of God's word, well, God didn't really mean that. Or, you know, that's archaic thinking. We don't have to think that way anymore. Maybe some of you have heard some of those arguments before, haven't you? 
sad to hear that there are some Christians that believe that. But no, we are to believe God's word. When God says he created our universe in the way he did within six days and all of life in six days, we need to believe that. We weren't there. God was there. He created it. And we know from Scripture that God cannot lie. God can't even deceive. It's not part of his character. So we can believe what he says that how he created the world and all life. We can believe when God tells us that the sun stood still for a day. Now, we may have a hard time explaining that with scientifically, but again, God is the one who created science. Actually, by the way, you know what science is? The term science only means knowledge. It's what we know. Yes, we have what we call the scientific method, but even that, God has given that to us. A means to discover truth. But we need to believe God's word from cover to cover. And how God also created us. What God says about sin. Even that these days too, there's a great attack on God's truth. When God defines what is sin, a lot of people like to say that, no, that's not sin. God made me this way. No, God didn't make you that way if it's sin. The point, though, still is that we need to come to Jesus, believe in him. Because in him we find refreshment. He'll even change our minds so we can understand what true sin is, as he defines in his word. All of it, again, is part of surrendering to him. So believing in him, then, also leads to faith. By the way, belief and faith aren't the same thing. People, you have used those two terms interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Belief comes before faith. You have to believe in order to have faith because faith is an act of trust. So faith requires action. So first, I believe in Jesus, and because I believed in Jesus, I place my faith in him by confessing my sins to him and surrendering my life to him. Faith is an action. I might have a story of a well-known man named Blondin. He was well-known for doing these tightrope tricks. And he decided one time that he would put up this cable across Niagara Falls. And the crowds came out to watch him do these different feats, going back and forth across the cable, tightrope walking. Finally got to one side, and he had a wheelbarrow all ready to go, and he said, how many of you believe me that I, c- that I can push someone in this wheelbarrow across to the side of the Niagara Falls. Oh yeah, we believe you could do that. We love to see that. It'd be exciting to see that. And then he asked the next question. Who wants to get into the wheelbarrow? <laughs> How many of you would have wanted to get into the wheelbarrow? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Did someone say that? We got to lose. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't have, wouldn't have that kind of faith in Blondin. I probably would have been one of the ones to stand aside and go, no way. <laughs> ah, excellent point. Don't have faith in God. Or, whoa, <laughs> boy, that came out wrong. <laughs> don't have faith in the person, but have faith in God that he'll protect you as Blondin takes you across. Oh boy, that's a bad slip, isn't it? (laughs) No, we have faith. We are to have faith in God. Yeah, there's a point to not testing him necessarily. But have faith in God. When God speaks to you and tells you in his word what to do, do it. Or when God speaks to you directly, do it. And you will find a great blessing because of it. So seek by believing in Jesus. And not only believe in him, but place your faith in him. Here's a couple points to this again. First, accept truth. We are to accept truth. 
James 2, verse 14 to 26 says this. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Let me stop here for a moment too, because people have often used, misused this passage to mean that, that actions save you. No actions don't save you. It is placing your faith in Jesus by confessing your sin in, to him. When you've done that, that actually is an act of faith. But if we have faith, and we see if we have faith, but we don't do anything to show for that faith, then we don't really have faith. That's the point that James is making here, by the way. James continues in verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was also fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So if we say we have faith and don't have actions, then we truly don't have faith. Faith, again, is belief in action. So again, we must first, part of the application of this, is to sec accept what Jesus says. Believe God's word, and then apply it to your life. Apply it, again, in those times of drought, of wandering in the wilderness, coming to Jesus, and accept what he has to say to you. When we come to Jesus and we believe in him, know that when you're in those times of wilderness in your life, that God is there with you and he will quench your spiritual thirst. I don't know about you, but I know there's times when God brings me into those wilderness times. Sometimes I question and say, Lord, why have you brought me into this? But I just trust him through it still. In those wilderness times, it's kind of like an iceberg. You ever seen an iceberg? On the top, it might look pretty big, doesn't it, at times? Did you know that iceberg is far bigger underneath? They actually talk about the iceberg that the Titanic hit. It didn't seem to be very big. But underneath it was huge. Like that iceberg though, we may not see much going on on top. But underneath the surface, God is doing something amazing. So when you go into those wilderness times that God brings you into, don't despair. Look to God and trust him because know that God is still at work in the situation. You may not feel his presence, but he's still there with you. As you promised in his word, he will never leave us 
or forsake us. You've heard me say this often, and I'll say it again, though. Many people say that Christianity is just a crutch, that God is just a crutch. I say he's far more than a crutch. He's like a stretcher. Because even in the good times, he carries me through. And even also in the tough times. In the wilderness, he is carrying us through. So again, in those times of drought in your life, in those times of trials and tribulations, seek by coming to Jesus. Drink from Jesus. Be immersed in his word and in prayer. And believe in Jesus. Believe that Jesus will take you through it. And then act in the direction that God calls you to go. By the way, we hear this term wait sometimes, right? We, sometimes in the wilderness we need to wait. And that too is an act of faith. Don't move and ask God tells you to move. But wait in him. Remember, wait is still a verb. It's still an act of faith. I want to encourage us to one point of action this morning, and it's this. Allow Christ to take you into the wilderness because he's going to do something in your life, prepare you for something that's going to be a, a great blessing, and he's going to use you to do something amazing. We need to allow Christ to take us into the wilderness so that we will come out, or sort of come to and be quenched of our thirst by him. Just like Jacob digging the wells, we need to dig deep into Jesus so that we will hit, and pour, hit the outpouring of Christ's refreshment of his Holy Spirit so that we draw close to him and so we can be effectively used for God's glory. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. These words that you said to your disciples, that if anyone thirsts, they used to come to you and to drink from you. So Lord God, we pray this, that we would come to you when we walk the wilderness that we come to you and listen to you through your word and in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much that we can come to you at any time. It doesn't have to be the wilderness time, but especially those times that you are never far away. You are right there with us. God, you are good.